what sort of uh, shape are our schools, the, one that in, the, the ones that Intel hires from today? In the U.S. first, and then where Intel hires its other engineers. Well, the, the US, Higher education is the question. <laughs> U.S. schools are still uh, universally ranked in the top. If you look at the top 50 or 100 universities in the world, the U.S. would rank, you know, have two-thirds or more of them listed. So the, the Stanford's right. and the Stanford of the East, Harvard, and, you know, there's other schools. <laughs> MITs, those are okay. Uh, but increasingly, uh, the Europeans have noticed the formula to m that makes U.S. universities work, especially higher ed, masters, PhDs. Chinese, obviously, have, have noticed, and by the way, we're helping the Chinese immensely because you can't go to a Chinese university that doesn't have five or ten associations with U.S. universities importing the curriculum, the talent, professors on leave, etc. So they're, going, they're copying everywhere, Xinhua, uh, Peking University, right down the list. So I think in 20 years, if the tr current trends continue, the U.S. will be kind of less than 50% of the top tier universities in the world. Right now, as, we are as measured by the number of engineers, as, as or measured the by the quality of the engineers coming out, it's another topic of the nationality of the engineers coming out of U.S. universities, because right. that's an entirely different topic than the quality of the U.S. universities. Okay, so let's hold that for a moment. I want to get right back to it, though. Let's talk about the output. How many engineers? I've read that there's lots more engineers graduating from Chinese and Indian universities than from the American universities. There are. What uh, are those numbers? Well, if you look at the numbers, uh, the U.S. graduates 60, 70,000 engineers a year. Right. And the, the, the wild estimates of the Chinese or the Indians are in the hundreds of thousands. You then have to kind of temper that with the quality of the engineer. What is it, a two-year engineering degree or a four-year engineering degree? And what is the quality of the engineer? I'd say that top quality, the U.S. still wins. Mm -hmm. Absolute volume of engineers, the U.S. doesn't win. We're losing. Um, but there are some also some, some exquisitely good universities. The Russians, for example. The Russians have a history of Cold War uh, the Russians didn't have any computers. And the way the Russians competed without computers was brains. So the Russians have absolutely the best algorithm guys, the best software guys on the planet, right. no question about it, and some of the Eastern European countries as well. So there are pockets of brilliance that, that far exceed the U.S. capability. But U.S. on a whole still wins top universities. Okay, so I'm an American venture capitalist, U.S. venture capitalist. I'm trying to help people start companies in the U.S. Our audience is comprised of largely uh, Americans, I think, U.S. citizens, leaders with a stake in the U.S. economy. Should we be concerned about the state of higher education and America's standing in the world? Well, absolutely, in my case, I, I think we're fat, dumb, and happy and, and on the downslide in this whole deal. Everybody likes a standard of living in the U.S. Standard of living goes pretty proportional to the level of education. Mm -hmm. If your level of education, especially in the sciences, is lacking, math and science, then long term, you have nowhere to hide because you're not going to be able to, to make the U.S. standard of living unless you're adding more value to what you do than other people. And you can't do that without as good, an educa good or better education. You know, we are venture capitalists too. You're, you're in the small part of it. You're the small guy. Right. Intel happens to, uh, John is a great venture capitalist, but we are, I think, the biggest high-tech venture capital company around. I think so. It used to be that 90% of our investments were made in the U.S. Right. Where are they made now? 50% in the U.S., 50% in Asia. In Asia. Yeah. If you hear from anybody that engineers in India and China are not entrepreneurial, can't think up new ideas, can't create businesses, send them to me. <laughs> They're dead wrong. <laughs> so uh, should we expect in the next couple of decades that America's innovation leadership is going to recede further and further relative to our world competitors? Well, uh, now you, you're getting into the whole issue of what makes competition or competitive economies or societies. And there are only three things that you can play with. Uh, one is the basic education system. You need smart people, and so you need the best trained engineers in the world. Right now, we have the best engineering schools, so we're doing that. You need to invest R&D funds because that's where the ideas come from. Right. You know, all of your venture capital investments come off of smart ideas and 
usually they come out of universities and those sort of places. Mm -hmm. And then you need the right environment to get smart people together, smart ideas. And environment is what governments create, tax rates, mm -hmm. intellectual property protection, all of those sort of things that allow smart people to form companies and create companies. Right. There's, a, there's also a little bit of, of uh, cultural stuff. You know, if you go to Latin America, failure is abhorred. So right. the entrepreneurs don't exist in Latin America to mm -hmm. a large extent because mm -hmm. they're afraid of failure. Right. In the U.S., I mean, you guys probably, when you fund somebody, if they've had two failures, you look upon that as success. Their experience. Because they, their experience. <laughs> they know what to do right the next time. We just want to make new mistakes. <laughs> so, so best people, R&D, and then the right yeah. infrastructure and the environment. Yeah. Stay with the people in the education for a moment, because you're telling me higher education, higher education is relatively speaking in good shape. Yeah. How about elementary education, public education? Well, you, you glossed over higher education is in good shape. You got to come back to 60 plus percent of the PhDs graduating are not U.S. nationals. Not U.S. nationals. Are but do they do they stay here? If our the wisdom of our government gives them an H-1B visa or a green card, yeah, this hey, this is a classic deal, folks. You go to a school in the United States as a foreign citizen. To get a PhD, you have to do research. Guess who funds the research primarily? We do. Taxpayers. Tax taxpayers yeah. So you get your PhD at the expense of the U.S. taxpayer, and then what do we tell the PhD at the end of his degree? Go home. We don't need you. Why would, why would we send them home? You know, John, I've thought about that for years. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Why do we send them home? We send them home because they're foreigners. It's a threat to national security? Well, if you... If you if you are not of the mindset that says national security is equated to economic strength, right. you send them home. Right. Some of us think that economic security is the backbone of national security. Right. You want the best, most vibrant economy in the world. You want the best and brightest to come to the United States. Right. You want to be the home of innovation, bright ideas, smart minds. So our national strategies have the best universities, bring the best minds to our universities, and then send them back. Kind of. Yeah. yeah. 